Stigma is a phenomenon that has deep roots in history and indeed is part of human nature. So the word stigma is correspondingly old with evidence all going back the way to the Middle Ages where it was used to describe the cut of a clumsy barber. And in post-classical texts, it means something like to brand. People are not only stigmatized for physical characteristics, but more particularly for invisible traits. And sometimes we also attach stigma to groups which are very mixed themselves. For example, people with psychiatric conditions, which are also complex themselves, not just only in terms of their symptoms, but also in terms of the biology of the conditions themselves. Now, as of today, we really don't know where psychiatric conditions come from. Let's say you have two people, let's call them Alice and Bob, and let's say they have the same number of risk variants and protective variants. Alice might be fine all of her life, whereas Bob might get diagnosed with a psychiatric disease at some point of his life. How can that be? You know, environment can actually interact with the genetics. Our childhood experiences, how we deal with stress, or our relationship to drugs and alcohol. And we cannot change the universal code we carry around within us, but we can certainly change the environment. Not only the people with a psychiatric condition themselves can change them, but all of us can change them. And let me tell you what, if we can change the environment, the question genes versus the environment becomes moot. It is more important to understand that we need to treat people with psychiatric conditions with love and compassion. Now, picture this. It is Christmas. At an indulgent family dinner, your grandfather has gone out into the cold to enjoy snaps and the smoke. Suddenly, he bursts back into and guesses that he is having breathing trouble and he's also feeling pain in his left chest, which is stretching down his left arm. As you might already know, this might be a heart attack, and quite rightly, and surely, surely you will call an ambulance to have doctors see him. After he gets diagnosed and he gets started on the treatment, you will do whatever you can do to help him back to normal life and health. And now, let's imagine another family member at this Christmas party. You're talking to your aunt. She feels sad all the time. She's tired. Life itself tires her. She doesn't have any energy anymore, and also her drive is decreased. Although you know that she liked traveling and socializing a lot, and that's what she did frequently in the past, now she's not feeling any pleasure doing these activities. Even though you know that something is wrong with her, you can bring yourself to address these symptoms head on because you're afraid to see even something um, wrong or to make the things worse. Furthermore, one of the relatives in the room is shouting from across the room, stop making such a fuss, pull yourself together and you will be fine again. Obviously, with these two scenarios in mind, we have to carefully differentiate between the obviously life-threatening and the potentially less life-threatening situation. But how do we even know how to prevent what state and how to recognize the states? Well, to answer that question, it is very important to first get a clear idea of what our organs in our body do. Our lungs, they enable us to inhale air and provide us with the oxygen needed. Our hearts pump the blood through the body and bring the oxygen where it is needed. And our stomachs and intestines, they supply us with the nutrients needed to keep all these processes up and running. And what happens if we get sick? We might feel tired and weak all the time. We might cough or we might get diarrhea or constipation. But what about our brains? Our brains make us think, they make us see, and they make us hear. They also make us feel. We can also communicate. It's because of my brain that I'm dreaming. They're also controlling our circulation and our breathing. And obviously, it is thanks to our brains that we can solve difficult mathematical formulas, express creativity and musicality, and make moral decisions. So in short, the brain is what makes you, you. Now, once we understand this, it is very easy to deduce what happens if our brain gets sick. Our movement can be hampered, 
so can our attention span or our memory. Sometimes we can't hear or can't see things, and sometimes we hear and see things which are not really there. Our touch sensory can be compromised, or our emotion can be really confused. We can be continuously sad, or we can be continuously happy, excited, and sometimes we can be aggressive towards other people. Also, the incessant desire for drugs, alcohol, and cigarettes can be a sign that our brain is sick and we need help. When a patient leaves the doctor's office, he remembers only 70% of what was said during the conversation. But it gets even worse. Once he goes out the, off out the office, he's only able to remember 30% of the whole conversation. And this is why I'm not bothering you tonight with like medical terms and diagnoses like paralysis, dementia, mania, depression, psychosis, prosognosia, and so on. What I prefer to actually tell you what's wrong in our brain based on its normal function. This concept is very transferable to many everyday life situations and can also be applied to them. For example, in the humanities, in engineering, or in the sciences, including the subfields of neuroscience and medicine. As a research neuroscientist and also as a future doctor, I received an excellent training in how to you know, render really simple information, cryptic and impenetrable. <laughs> but as a teacher and student, I know how important it is to actually talk to one another and not pass one another, because this can turn into um, prejudice, resentment, and ignorance. And also, it can turn into stigmatization. In other words, a communication which is effective and a two-way dialogue can actually help us to destigmatize people with mental illness. The idea to foster such dialogue goes all the way back to 2010. In that year, I had the extraordinary opportunity to go to Ghana for a medical internship. I also met Julia Heuper there. Once we came back, we were sure we want to go back to Ghana but we also thought about really sustainable ways to help on the long term. The result is on the move, an association with structures in 13 African countries and which runs activities which envision every participant as a multiplier. They not only spread our ideas and principles here in Germany, but also in Africa, and also they put them into practice cross-culturally by just communicating to other people. And guess what? It takes a lot. It not only takes the understanding for a different culture, obviously, but it also takes something more active, the chance for an exchange and learning. And possible projects are not dreamed up behind the desk here in Dresden or, let's say, in Accra, the capital of Ghana. They actually arise because we go through situations together and then they make us think and reflect. Time and again, during our stay in Ghana, we realized that people are treated in myriad ways. They are locked away, they are chained up, they are tortured because of having a medical condition, like a psychiatry condition. We also realized that according to the official statistics, just very few people actually had a psychiatric diagnosis. Was that perception bias at work, or does it reflect reality? Now, the country used to have 14 psychiatrists for a population of 26 million people, which translates roughly to two psychiatrists for a city as big as Berlin. Obviously, these psychiatrists and the psychiatric nurses were not able to see all their patients in a suitable structure. But it is not only the limited structure which makes people unlikely to go and see a doctor. A great bigger impact has the actual belief that people with psychiatric conditions are cursed, contagious, a threat to one's own life, unwanted by God. Sensory disorders, for example, are brought on because you're taking an evening bath which is too hot. Or a patient suffering severe cramps and wetting themselves is not receiving any first aid because people believe the urine is contagious. And it can be even improper to reveal that you are the relative of a patient with a psychiatric disease. Because then you yourself get stigmatized, 
and brand it. And this is, why it, well, this is why it makes it so difficult to actually talk about psychiatry and psychiatric diseases in Ghana. And not only in Ghana, by the way. This is true for many sub-Saharan countries and also for many countries around the world. In a context of ignorance and prejudice, it might be understandable that when you talk to people about psychiatry and diagnoses, it is not really easy for them to follow in a neutral manner. In many conversations, the subject immediately sparks resistance at an emotional level when you bring up these topics, and productive discussion is not possible. But if you talk about the brain as such, the primary response is curiosity and thirst for knowledge. This is why our concept is actually not putting the psychiatric disease in the focus, but rather the brain behind the psychiatric disease, the brain. Because if you talk about the structure of the brain, the function of the brain, or the connectivity of the brain, people are actually coming up with questions about diseases of and changes in the brain. Let me give you an example. Have you ever wondered why a kiss on your back feels less intense than a kiss on your lips? Well, the reason for this is the homunculus. I taught 12-year-old kids in Ghanaian schools about this guy. He is actually representing parts of our body in relation to the brain, in proportion to the amount of sensory data they supply and motor instructions they receive. That being said, and just looking at the sensory apparatus, this means the more nerve cells are allocated to a particular body area, the more information about this area actually reaches our brain. Now, you might wonder, why are the hands and the lips depicted so big? Well, if you think about that, when you eat in your daily life, when you drink, when you touch something, including a people's body, another person's body, you need your hands and your lips. You don't really need the legs. You don't really need your back or your upper arms. And this is why they are depicted correspondingly small. Now, this guy wasn't contained to leave it there, though. What happens, he asked, if we lose our arms and need to eat with our legs? Does their bit of the brain become any bigger? As I think, this is a very, very smart question. And it not only shows that we were able to increase the passive knowledge, but also to rouse curiosity and finally make people think about the organ which makes them think. And sometimes we have also kids coming up to us after the session and declaring, oh, I also want to become a neuroscientist right now. What I've been describing here is the so-called Brain Awareness Project, which was first established in Ghana in 2015. We did not want to make it contingent on our presence in Africa as this would be the proverbial drop in the ocean. This is why we were very keen from the beginning to also train the local hospital staff, which is now actually running our project in our absence. If we will be successful or not, I can tell you right now, because it also depends on many more factors. For example, if the Guinean government is willing to allocate financial resources towards clinical and research psychiatry. But I can tell you that it's very encouraging that we have a lot of people coming up to us after the sessions and telling us that we were able to make them rethink about the attitudes. And it's also very heartening that we also received, or already received, three more invitations from African countries. In less under a month, for instance, we will go to Kenya to set up the same initiative. Now, by looking at all these activities in sub-Saharan Africa, we do not want to lose sight of our aunt here home at Christmas. When people say, she should stop making such a fuss. She just should pull herself together. She will be fine again. This should not be taken as taken. This should be taken as the impetus to actually set up this initiative here in German schools and institutions too to reach the heart of our society. Because our society is not longer torturing, this does not mean that we have an enlightenment understanding and know how to deal with people with psychiatric conditions. Based on my personal experiences with family members, friends, acquaintances, and colleagues, 
I under the impression that the attitude in Germany today towards psychiatry is as backwards as it is in other industrialized nations, emerging economies, and third world countries. So, my vision is relating to the concept of introduced before, looking at the brain before the disease of the brain, for us to foster the unbiased dialogue about the brain and to raise awareness of how the brain, just as any other part of your body, is susceptible to disease. If your brain gets ill, it is not only a physical suffering. You will suffer on a more profound level, including your personalities. I think this is something we need to be aware of, both individually and as a society. The brain is what makes me, me, and you, you. So let's take charge of it. Thank you. <laughs>